Our story begins with John Resident, also known as Leon, entering Raccoon City. Now, you see, there was a little problem. There had been a zombie outbreak, then a trucker gets bitten in the shoulder, note this point because it will be important in a few minutes. Then we meet Claire, the other protagonist of the game. You see, Resident Evil 2 is basically two games or has two campaigns in it. Once you play as Leon, then you play from Claire's perspective. You can reverse this too, but this video focuses on the default Leon campaign. Leon and Claire take a ride across town to take in the atmosphere, but then, zombie jump scare. The car crashes and then the trucker comes in from behind and now both our heroes have parted ways. And I will tell you the story of how John Resident defied all odds and came out victorious in the end. Resident Evil 2 is the quintessential survival horror game to play. I know Silent Hill exists, but shut up. This video is about Resident Evil 2. While many may not say it's perfect due to various reasons, it still holds up very well, even all these years later. Now we enter Kendo's gun shop. Clearly seeing that we're normal, he still points a shotgun at us. What an idiot. So now we're in this shop. Secure. Nothing can get in. Especially through those glass windows where Kendo is uh, standing. Yep, nothing will go wrong. And then there's zombies in the shop now. For its time, Resident Evil 2 was a revolutionary game. It took what made Resident Evil 1 great and scaled it up to a much more bigger scope. Now here you can see I'm wasting my ammo and that's the thing about the game. You play too carelessly, you'll resort to using the knife, which I definitely did not do throughout my playthrough. Definitely not. Inventory management and rationing supplies was a big part of this game. Unlike other action shooters, you couldn't take on every single enemy and just be fine. You need to be aware of how many bullets you have and how much first aid you got. Another thing to mention is the absolutely amazing pre-rendered backgrounds while playing at a higher resolutions do make them pixelated. They still provide an amazing atmosphere for the whole game. I especially love these outdoor city backgrounds and seeing the remnants of what was once a sprawling city now reduced to an abandoned ruin. But unfortunately, the city part doesn't last too long as we get into the police station, which is basically the first half of the game. Outside the station, Leon finds some Zaza to heal himself. Now I have to share something. This next moment personally for me, is one of the greatest moments I ever witnessed in a video game. Take a look. The soundtrack that kicks in, the panning shot of the silent station, it was mind-blowing to witness this. Then we go and meet Will Smith who unfortunately has been bitten by the zombies. He gives us a key card and asks us to fuck off. With his keycard, we open up the doors that lead us into the other parts of the station. But there's one thing to note. I absolutely love this fake UI on the computer, but why the fuck is there a button called test with this photo on it? Who even is that? And did I mention the door opening sequence? My god, is this such an iconic thing? They basically hid the loading process behind these animations, so it seems like a seamless transition from one room to another. Well, it was seamless at the time. In the item box, I store items, because I don't need these right now. Also, an abomination crawls across the outside of the window and that thing is, well, a liquor. I know it's kinda hot, not gonna lie. Liquors are a very deadly sort of enemy. They don't go down easily and take quite a bit of damage to die. Thankfully, I smoked some Zaza to restore my health afterwards. Now this is the part where I have to talk about the police station. This used to be an art museum before it became a police station and whoever designed this building is an absolute psycho because for example, you need to get a gem here by burning the fireplace that'll burn the painting. I mean who hid that gem in there? There'll be more cases like this like here you have to push the statues onto their designated places to unlock the second gem from the statue. I mean what kind of maniac designs a building like this filled with puzzles? But regardless, it's absolutely fun to figure this stuff out because there's always this sense of accomplishment but also confusion like, okay, I got a crank handle, what the fuck am I supposed to do with that? Then there will be times where you're injured or out of bullets and you'll get swarmed with zombies like this and at moments like these, you'll be regretting your earlier choices in the game. And the save room, man, the save theme, this is the music to my life. I 
I share a very personal bond with this theme and I love it whenever it plays. Oftentimes I just stand there in the save room taking in the music because I know as soon as I step out the door, horror awaits. Then we get to the star's team room where we find out about the events of President Evil 1 and the Spencer Mansion and all that good jazz. Then Claire shows up because her brother Chris was part of the star's team but he's nowhere to be found. Oh, and we also find this medallion because we slot it into the statue at the front hall and get a key, you idiot, why else? Also, the voice acting in this game is just 10-10. I love it. So cheesy. It's good to see you're still among the living. It looks like we're not gonna find your brother here after all. So we try to move on, but we need that key from the statue first. Also, jump scare. <laughs> Stop tickling me. What? Resident Evil 2 does its gameplay very, very well. The thing is, it's like a small loop. You need key items, and to get those key items, you need to find other key items and keys and use them together to go into new rooms and get a new key item like a crank and the get the final thing you need. That's at least what the loop is during the police station segment. You don't just randomly come up with this sort of design. Each item and key item is strategically placed in locations where you don't feel the game is becoming repetitive. After every small achievement, you get to see a new location or a new room or find a new weapon or ammo. Each task completed rewards you with something and that's a constant serotonin the game gives you. I wish Resident Evil 2 would cure my depression too, but oh well. Here we have our first major puzzle, the library. To solve this puzzle, you must use all your brain cells and move these two shelves to the right. This gives you the first plug. Now there are four plugs in total and you need all of them to get out of the police station which is our hero's front goal. But like I said before, these plugs are hidden behind other tasks and puzzles and you need stuff to proceed with these tasks. Like this crank in this room. Finally, crank became useful. But after using that, you see, oh no, I need something else now, don't I? There's cog wheels here, maybe one of them is missing? Then there's this strange metal door here too and it's locked, well, off to find the cog wheel, I guess. The thing is, we know about this now, but in between this and finding the cog wheel, we'll have to complete many other objectives too. So in a way, the game is not linear, or at least not too much linear. Here's a map of the police station. If I were to give you a general idea, you're always going back and forth between the first and second floor and east and west wing taking items from one place and putting them into another and then taking that item and putting them into another place. The design is basic but the design is also absolutely amazing. Simplicity at its finest because at the end of the day you just need to have fun. In between the game you'll find notes and diaries and this will give you some backstory to what happened here before you arrived. Definitely must read these if you're into knowing the deep story of it all. Now here's another obstacle. A helicopter on fire. We need to put out this fire to proceed further. On the other end, we have crows. Anyway, we have to see the place where the copter crashed and coincidentally, there is a water tank right above it and a sign that says, excessive pressure may rupture the water tank. Hmm. I see. Of course, right after this, we find a valve handle and hold on, a valve handle? But yeah, using that we do what the sign exactly tells us not to do and put out the fire. Now we head into the room that the helicopter was blocking and here we press in those two gems we found and get a key in return. Again, what absolute psychopath designed this place? Anyway, with this key we now have access to new areas that were locked before. You know what, on second thought, let's keep this door locked anyway. Through this room, we enter into Will Smith's room, but unfortunately, Will Smith has become a zombie. No, Will Smith, please stay back. Don't do this. Anyway, from Will Smith's room, we get another key. Along the way, I went to the East Wing and found another plug. And guess what? Liquor jump scare. Oh no! We have three plugs, but we need four in total. To spoil the story, the fourth plug is inside that steel door where there's a cog wheel missing. But to find that cog wheel, we need to delve further deep into the police station and go into the basement. And there are dogs here. Not the cute ones, but the angry zombie ones. Here we also meet a new character, thick Chinese mommy GF, otherwise known as Ada Wong. Now she's here to find her boyfriend, John. To find his whereabouts, she's in the basement looking for a reporter. 
After rolling up some Zaza with her, we head into the holding cells and find the reporter. Now he was looking into Umbrella's shenanigans before the chief had him locked away. Spoiler alert, the chief and Umbrella are working together. Then we hear a man taking a very violent dump in the distance. What was that? Ben the reporter tells us to get out of here through the sewer so we do that. But there's giant spiders down here, god damn you Ben. Now remember the plugs we've been looking for? All of that adventure we had so far, that has led us to this room in particular. On the wall there's a panel that takes in four plugs, but we have three plugs. That is not the correct amount of plugs, goddammit. Now this is the last leg of the police station area. We meet Ada outside the room and cram her into the ventilation shaft. We play as Ada for a while while we shoot a bunch of dogs, do a very simple puzzle and get a key that we throw back to Leon. Is this part filler? Probably. Does this affect the story in any way? Absolutely not. I also found a keycard in one of the rooms that lets us into the armory. Apart from the ammo, we also get a choice. Either we pick up the machine gun or we pick up the side pack to increase our inventory slots. Here's what happens here. Whatever we don't pick, you can pick that item again when you're playing as Claire in the second campaign. But since this video only covers the first campaign, we're going to get both items. Claire can handle shit on her own, she's a big girl. Later we get our hands on a magnum. Now this item, we'll be saving for the final boss of the game. In the game, it's very simple. Your performance against the boss battles depends on either your skill or how much ammo or first aid you have. I basically stock up on heavy weapons and first aid and tank all the damage. So bosses are only very difficult if you're just depending on weak weapons like the pistol or machine gun. Anyway, with the key we just found, we finally head into the room that has the cogwheel. But before we do that, we have to do another very simple puzzle. Again, doing the puzzles is basically trial and error, they're not difficult and solving them is actually pretty satisfying. We get the cogwheel, head back up to the third floor, put it in and get the plug. We also get the option to fast travel down to the basement through here, so that's good. Saves quite a bit of travel time. We hear Ben getting violated in the distance because the villain of the story found him. No! Get, get away! Ew, that's gross. We check up on him and turns out he's been infected by the virus. Then he tells us what's going on behind the scenes and fucking rips himself into half. What a madman. Ada runs away and we go after her. In the plugs room, we meet the thing that crawled out of Ben. It's all grown up now. This is a mini boss battle. Meet the coronavirus. Remember what I said about being prepared? Yeah, I had my machine gun fully loaded and this took like 2 minutes. Now we plug in the plugs and go to the second third of the game. The sewers. Ada falls from the fucking roof and Leon's like, oh my god, don't run away like that. Spoiler alert, she runs away. We also get to meet Annette Birkin, this fucker's wife. She tells us that Umbrella wanted to take the G-Virus that William Birkin made so they shot him. He took the virus while dying and became this monstrosity. Pretty neat way to tie up the story to be honest. And oh, Leon gets shot but I don't know if that was important or not. So after telling us the whole William Birkin story, she gets bitch slapped by Ada and fucking falls. Lamau. Then we go down to maybe find her body or something but it cuts to black. Suspense. Then Leon wakes up and is like, hey yo, what the fuck bro? And goes after Ada. Right at the start we find a metal, we need two of these to proceed further. One we find right away but the other one is where Ada is. The sewers part isn't that complicated apart from the spiders and zombies, there's not much else. But there is one special thing that makes me laugh every time I play the game. When we catch up with Ada, this happens. A giant fucking alligator comes out of the water. I love this sequence, man. I mean, why the fuck is there a giant alligator down here? Anyway, press a button, a gas cylinder drops, the gator bites and we shoot it to blow up its goddamn face. Jesus fucking Christ, Leon. Then Ada is like, I'm sorry, babe, ooh woo, let me pat you up. We find the second medal and that's pretty much it for the sewers part. We find a tram that leads us into the factory, another small part of the game. Here we have a mini boss battle with William or rather just a sequence where we have to look out for his attacks. The factory is what I like to call the run and gun part of the game. You just have to keep pushing through and through and follow the path to the right or the east. Go to the left side or the west wing and that gives you a shotgun upgrade, which I missed. 
Then we get on this platform to head into the laboratory which is basically the third half and the finale of the game. Inside the train engine, William strikes again and bitch slaps Ada through the wall. I guess that's revenge for her bitch slapping Annette earlier. Outside the train, William throws a stick at us and gets very angry. Now this boss battle is a bitch if you don't have any heavy weapons, ammo or first aid. But small issue though, I forgot my magnum in the item box. Fuck. Thankfully I had a shotgun and many shotgun shells. While William really did a number on me in this fight, I kept smoking the Zaza and recovered from any damage. After downing him, we go check on Ada and come back out to see William has apparently fucked off into the night. We are now at the Umbrella Labs. This is basically the place where they made this new strain of the virus. Our current objective is to escape, but before that we have quite a bit of shenanigans to do. Basically the labs is like a rehash of the police station in a way. Similar to that place, here we also have to go back and forth between different rooms and find items and open up new places, but it's not as long or big as the police station and it's fairly quite simple to figure out. I always found this central part of the lab very ominous looking. It's dark and the height of it all makes it look very menacing. The whole labs area is like a visual representation of what Umbrella really is and what they stand for. We also meet a new enemy type here, Sentient Zaza. You can burn this one by lighting the oil on the floor. But later on you'll find actual standing Zaza plants. Best way to deal with them is by using the flamethrower. But back to the lab again. The backgrounds for these labs and rooms are dark and gritty and them being in a classic 90s style with low resolution further adds to their personality. So we get the fuse to power up the place, then we see this giant monstrosity. I love how it's supposed to be so huge that you can just forget about fighting this thing. It's a living thing but it's part of the background. Very ominous. I also found upgrade parts for the magnum which will help out a lot in the end. Then we get a key card, fight Mothra get an MO disc to open the final area of the lab and oh, we meet again with Annette Birkin who apparently didn't die after falling from four stories. She explains how Ada is some sort of agent who got close to John just so she could spy on Umbrella. Of course, being the boy scout that he is, Leon doesn't believe her. But in a hilarious twist of events, Annette gets bonked on the head by a steel pipe. We take the G-Virus from her and run away. Later it turns out Ada is a spy who demands we give her the virus but then she has a change of heart. Also she gets shot and falls to her death. And look who it is, Annette Perkin. Cheesy and campy now but this was revolutionary storytelling back in 1998. Very few games had come up to the standard back then and seeing this for the first time was very thrilling. I like the little touch that if you check Ada's gun on the ground, it was actually empty so basically she was never going to shoot Leon. Now our goal is simple, we need to escape from this facility. On our way we come face to face with these zombies that may or may not be nude old men. Using the MO disc, we open the door that leads to the tram station but in between we have one final obstacle, William Birkin. And this time, I didn't forget the Magnum. Not gonna lie, this form of his absolutely scared me as a kid. After a couple of shots though, he changes again into a new form, that of a big dog. Thankfully, the Magnum in its upgraded form makes quick work of Birkin and we easily escape the facility and that is the end of the story. Now here's the deal, to get the true ending and face William one more time for the last time, you need to play the B campaign as Claire or Leon if you played this campaign as Claire. But that is something I'm not gonna do in this video. In the end we meet up with Claire and Sherry and escape on the train. You might be asking who the fuck is Sherry? She's actually William and Annette's daughter that tags along with Claire in her campaign. Overall Resident Evil 2 is a milestone, an achievement in the genre of survival horror. While Silent Maid set the standard for the more paranormal and psychological aspects of the genre, Resident Evil was the flagship title if you wanted horror with some action added to the mix. This game along with the original Silent Hill basically standardized and formalized what horror games were supposed to be like. Surely there were early games as well like Alone in the Dark and more but this was the point in time where the general public was introduced to the horrors that a game like this may present and man it was awesome. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.